God is good. As you can see, the message for today is entitled Victim or Overcomer. We're going to look at this subject today. I will kindly invite you to join me in a word of prayer because we need the Lord's help today. Please kneel with me for a word of prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come boldly before your throne of grace, Father. It is the only sure place to be. Before we begin today, I want to pray and ask that you forgive me of my sins, that you cleanse me of all iniquity, that I can hide behind Christ and that he can direct my mind so that everything can be articulated in such a way, Father, that it will reach our hearts and it will bring us closer to Jesus because it is that closeness that we need with our Lord and Savior that is going to be able to help us to be completely healed. Father, I want to pray for every single person that has been able to join us here today. Lord, I want to ask for an angel to see, sit beside us, beside each of us, and to protect us, Father. We know that the enemy is doing whatever he can to slow us down or to take us off track. And we pray for your help today as we listen to your word. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that you've given us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray and ask all of this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today I want us to look at this concept of victim or overcomer. And in order to do so, we are going to go to the very beginning of time. And when I say the very beginning of time, we're going to be specifically looking at the entrance of sin into the universe and then at the entrance of sin into this earth, this world, specifically here where we are. And we're going to see something very important that defines these two options that you see on the screen. Because ultimately, brothers and sisters, at the end of time, as the judgment is complete, we're going to be seen as two separate individuals, either as a victim or as an overcomer. In order to travel back, we're going to look at a statement found in the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1. And it's going to remind us of the experience of Satan as he was becoming jealous of Jesus. I think we are all familiar with what happened there at the beginning of time. In fact, it is, it is extremely familiar to us because it demonstrates the reasons for this great controversy that exists between Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels. The Bible clearly tells us that Satan wanted to be like God and he became je je jealous of the only being in the universe who is like God. And that being is Jesus Christ. And here, as we read these two paragraphs or three paragraphs, I want us to think about this victimhood that is being formed, this narrative that is going to be coming through or rather from Satan. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page, starting on page 18, paragraph 2. And here's what she relates as, as these things are taking place in the beginning when sin originated in the heart of the deceiver himself. She says, speaking of Satan, Satan left the immediate presence of the Father dissatisfied and filled with envy against Christ. Here's this jealousy that we are all familiar with. We know this. Concealing his real purposes, he assembled the angelic host. He introduced his subject, which was himself. As one aggrieved, he related the preference. So let's, let's, let's move us into that particular scene. Here's Satan, and he's gathering all the angels that he can in order to tell them something. He wants to convince them of something. Is he going to convince them that he's jealous of Christ? Of course not. He's ignorant of that. But here's what he does. As one aggrieved, he related the preference God had given Jesus to the neglect of himself. He told them that henceforth all the sweet liberty the angels had enjoyed was at an end. For had not a ruler been appointed over them to whom they from henceforth must yield servile honor? He stated to them that he had called them together to assure them that he no longer would submit to this invasion of his rights and theirs, that never would he again bow down to Christ. 
that he would take the honor upon himself, which should have been conferred upon him, and would be the commander of all who would submit to follow him and obey his voice. There was contention among the angels. Satan and his sympathizers were striving to reform the government of God. They were discontented and unhappy because they could not look into his unsearchable wisdom and ascertain his purposes in exalting his son Jesus and endowing him with such unlimited power and command. They rebelled against the authority of the Son. If we pay close attention to what is going on here, we are going to see that when this controversy began to take place, Satan immediately went to whoever he could find from among the angels and he presented himself as what? As a victim of the decision that the God of the universe had taken. Why is Christ being chosen over me? The Father and the Son are being unfair. They're trying to take away mine, and as he said to them, your rights. We are being victims of these two rulers who are trying to rob us of what should belong to us. This was the way Satan was presenting what was taking place in the universe. He was presenting himself as a victim of an unfair God, of a government that was not headed in the right direction. And in fact, Satan's goal and prerogative, as he told the other angels, was to do what? to make sure that he secures the rights that he and them should have had. This was his way of thinking. He presented himself as a victim. It is very interesting that this is the very original scene of when sin broke out in the universe. Now, as we come to this world now, and we open our Bibles to Genesis, to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, we are going to see that the exact same thing was being mimicked by who? Well, by those who followed into his footsteps. So let's head over to Genesis chapter 3 and read it for ourselves. Genesis chapter 3 verse 12 says, here's God coming to Adam. And we're specifically focusing on Adam because he was the head of the human race and all the accountability and the responsibility was placed upon him. And God was trying to find out from him, from Adam himself, what had happened just after he had eat, eaten the forbidden tree. And here's what Adam says. Now let's compare what Adam says to what Satan was trying to present in the very beginning. Adam answers God and says, and the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. God comes to Adam and Eve and he's trying to find out why they have broken his command. Why have you broken his, my command? Why have you gone against what I have asked you not to go against? And what is the first thing that Adam says? He does the exact same thing that Satan did in the very beginning. He does two things as we can look at as we look at this verse. First, he shifts the blame to who? To his wife. She, my the woman, my wife, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Secondly, he indirectly blames God by stating what? The woman whom thou gavest to be with me. Here, brothers and sisters, we find the danger of presenting oneself as a victim instead of taking responsibility. It wasn't my fault. It was God's fault. Why? Because he gave me that woman. It wasn't my fault to eat from the forbidden tree. Why? I was just a victim of my wife. 
It was my wife who gave me that, that forbidden fruit and asked me to eat it. In both cases, in the beginning, in the very original sin that we find in the universe, and also in the very first sin that we find here on this earth, we see the exact same idea being formed, this, this idea of, of victimhood found in the perpetrator. Now, in the world of psychology, there's something very interesting that people talk about which resembles a little bit what we see here in the spiritual realm. Now, obviously, we're just using this as an illustration, but the idea is one and the same. So, in the world of psychology, uh, there's this condition that is called a victim mentality. And victim mentality is when a person feels like a victim even when there's evidence that says otherwise. It can affect all types of relationships. Signs can vary, but may include blaming others <laughs> and not taking responsibility for one owns actions. This is exactly what we see with Satan in the very beginning, blaming God for not choosing him to be also part of the councils in heaven, blaming God for going against his personal rights, Satan's or so he thought personal rights. And then he took that and he did not just keep it to himself. What did Satan do? He went on and gathered all the angels that he could gather and being driven by this very mentality, tried to convince them that God and Christ have wronged against him. Now there's another condition that we learn about from the world of psychology, which will also play a key role for us to understand something today as we're looking at these things from primarily from a spiritual perspective and the battle against the biggest perpetrator, which is sin. That other condition is called cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance is the mental discomfort that results from holding two conflicting beliefs, values, or attitudes. People tend to seek consistency in their attitudes and perceptions. So this conflict causes unpleasant feelings or of unease or discomfort. The inconsistency between what people believe and how they behave, and here's the key, motivates them to engage in actions that will help minimize feelings of discomfort. People attempt to relieve this tension in different ways, such as by rejecting, explaining away, or avoiding new information. So how can we tie this in with what we saw happening with Satan and with Adam? Well, what did Adam do? Here comes God and asks of him what has gone wrong. So there's this conflict that is internally taking place in Adam. But instead of taking responsibility and facing reality, he does what? He runs away to try to find words to explain or to avoid what the Father is bringing to him to escape taking responsibility for himself. And I want us to keep that in mind as human beings because it is extremely important. In fact, the Bible talks a lot about cognitive dissonance, and we're going to see it now from the Word of God just in a second. But before we jump into the Old Testament, I want us to keep this in mind. I want us to keep in mind that the Bible is clear and tells us that we have all sinned and gone astray. In other words, we have all chosen to avoid taking responsibility for what has taken place. And as we continue this spiritual walk, because we talk about the fact how we need to be with Jesus day in and day out, we need to keep in mind that as we continue our spiritual walk, we are going to be faced on a continual basis with cognitive dissonance. This is why when Christ comes, what is the very first job of the Spirit to do? To convict of sin. The conviction of sin, which is the main 
and first most responsibility of the Spirit is not something that you and I will always welcome freely. It will create a tension within us and it would be natural to us to escape that, to explain it away, to reject it, to run away from taking responsibility from ourselves and seek to recognize ourselves as victims. But let's elaborate more and it's going to become clearer as we talk about these things. So now think about the concept of cognitive dissonance as we read the following verses and paragraphs from Patriarchs and Prophets. Here are the Jewish people. God wants to take them away. He wants to take them away from Egypt. And He wants to do so because His people have been there for a much longer time than it was needed. Not only have they been there for much longer than it was needed, they have actually began to become accustomed to the environment. Let's begin reading in Exodus chapter 1, verses 8, and we'll go all the way down to verse 14, just to be reminded of what was taking place with the Jewish people back then. The Bible says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it happen in the event of war, that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. Now let me stop here for just a second and ask you, do you think that the experience of the Jewish people was going in the positive or the negative direction here. I think it's pretty clear from the verses that they were experiencing a hard life. There was nothing good about this life that they were going to live now in Egypt. It was unpleasant. They were going to be continually suppressed by the Egyptian rulers for the reason that we see here in these verses. Then we continue reading. And it says, But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. So this process is going on for a certain period of time now. They are being afflicted. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. So not only were things bad, as we see now, things are progressively getting worse for the Jewish people. Who in their right mind would want to remain in a place where they were continually being pressed to work as hard as they can, to build cities for the Egyptians? And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. Now let's place ourselves in their shoes and think for a moment as we have read these verses. How many of you here would want to escape that for a better land and a better life? Now I come from an immigrant family and many people around the world immigrate from one place on this earth to another place on this earth. Why? Because they're seeking a better life. Now, how many of you here would respond positively if a person comes about and says, listen, I can help you immigrate to the promised land. I am going to give you a way out of this bondage that you find yourselves into. How many of you here will immediately respond positively to such an offer? I would venture to guess that most of us would put up our hand, right? Wouldn't we? I mean, it sounds like the logical thing to do, doesn't it? 
Look at these people, they're in bondage. I mean, they're, they're slaves. They're worked like dogs, for a lack of a better word. Who wouldn't want to escape that? Well, let me bring you back to what we talked about. Remember when we looked at these terms just prior to beginning reading in this chapter? Cognitive dissonance. What did cognitive dissonance teach us? It taught us that we as human beings would rather stick with that which is familiar to us then change to something new and different. When a change is introduced, the human organism would rather stick with that which it knows and it is familiar. So what do you think happened to the Egyptians as God was attempting to take them out of the land of Egypt? Did they welcome the solution with open arms? Well, let's read a little bit more from Patriarchs and Prophets where she opens up the verses even more. We'll begin on page 260, paragraph 2. Many were content. What does it say? Many were content to remain in bondage rather than meet the difficulties attending removal to a strange land. And the habits of some had become so much like those of the Egyptians that they preferred to dwell in Egypt. They were, not, they were not up for immigration. Here comes their God, who's already proven to them. He uses a servant. But what do the people say? No, 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 we're, we're fine. We're fine here. Well, there, there's no need for us to change. We don't need to deal with things now. We, we'd rather stay here. Wait a minute, you'd rather stay and be a slave to Pharaoh and work for him day and night, then escape to a place that is going to be much better than this, to a place that God already told you He was going to give to you as a nation? Continue reading. Therefore the Lord did not deliver them by the first manifestation of His power before Pharaoh. He overruled events more fully to develop the tyrannical spirit of the Egyptian king and also to reveal Himself to His people. Beholding His justice, His power, and His love, they would choose to leave Egypt and give themselves to His service. The task of Moses would have been much less difficult had not many of the Israelites become so corrupted that they were unwilling to leave Egypt. Now, what is this little portion of the Bible teaching us when we look at it from a much bigger perspective? We know that Egypt symbolizes this world of sin. Well, if Egypt symbolizes this world of sin, because that's what slavery is all about, that's what this bondage is all about, the people of God, that God is trying to take away from this world of sin. Well, let's look at this lesson and apply it to ourselves, because we know that Paul tells us that all these things have been given to us as examples, haven't they? have they not? So we're reading the Old Testament, we're looking at the life of the Israelites, and at the first glance we would be like, well, <laughs> if I were in their shoes, there's no way I was going to be one from among those who were going to reject the escape out of Egypt. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that they as a people had a really hard time allowing the Lord to deliver them from that bondage. They, they, they did not want to face the change. They had gotten used to things. We as human beings would rather stick with that which is familiar than what? Than with something new. Well, think about that in the concept of fighting against sin and bad character traits. What is it easier for us? Well, to stick with that which is familiar. 
Paul gives us one of the most important lessons that can be found in the Word of God in Romans chapter 7 and as he continues into chapter 8. He gives us this illustration of these two separate individuals that he is. So let's open chapter 7 in the book of Romans and read verses 14 through to 25. Verse 14 begins and says, For we know that the law is spiritual. Again, we're trying to connect what we've learned so far and take the lessons that we've seen in the Old Testament, take the, these psychological concepts that we talk about and bring them into our individual battle against sin. The title of the message today is Victim or Overcomer. So let's read Romans chapter 7, verse 14, going forward. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. What is Paul telling us? Listen, I've been sold under sin. It is more comfortable for me <laughs> to stick with that which is familiar. I might not, I might know the difference, but it's more comfortable for me to stick with that which is familiar. This is what human nature tells us. He goes on, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. The fallen human nature would rather do that which is carnal than that which is spiritual. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my mem members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Both Satan and Adam were indeed victims. But they were not victims of the Father or the Son. They were victims of sin. There are two kinds of victimhood mentality in this world. One that is of the flesh. One that keeps us connected to the things of the flesh and pushes us to mind the things of the flesh? When Adam was confronted, the first thing that he did is try to find a way out. To run away from taking responsibility and accountability for himself. It's the easier way out. It is what feels good and easy. And Paul tells us, listen, we're going to have this battle. This old man that has been part of every single one of us, for we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, will be pushing against us. In fact, once we become a Christian, we become that much more aware of things. The flesh will be constantly roaring against us. And you know what, brothers and sisters? It is easier for us to choose to stick with the flesh. We don't like changes. That's the kind of beings we are. 
It creates discomfort. And this is why Paul here is crying out, Oh, wretched man that I am. He's understanding this concept we've been trying to look at. He understands that he's caught. He understands that he just keeps on doing the same thing. Oh, wretched man that I am. I just keep on resorting to the old thing. How many of us here struggle with something and it just keeps on coming back? Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he gives the answer. He brings us to the hope now as we transition into that. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. He introduces now and goes into Romans chapter 8 and talks about this idea of the battle that takes place in the mind and how there are only two groups of people on this earth, those who mind the things of the Spirit and those who mind the things of the flesh. The natural man wants to mind the things of the flesh. And when the Spirit comes, there's conflict inside of us. There's conflict inside of us as the, and the enemy will do whatever he can in order to keep us trapped. In order to have us run away from accountability. Well, it's not my fault. It's Adam fault, Adam's fault. This is one of the main teachings in Christianity today. You know what? We live in a sinful world. Adam sinned and because Adam sinned, we are all doomed. There's no escape. We're just going to have to deal with this and, and recognize that sin is part of our lives and just keep on uh, living life as it is because there's no way to fix this problem that Adam brought into the human race. Running away from accountability for what we do. It's the easier way out. It is what we would rather choose. This is exactly what this illustration in the book of Exodus is telling us. We don't need you to take us out of this bondage. We're okay here. We're okay in this world of sin. We don't need to be taken away from here. But thankfully, God has given us a promise. Not only has He given us a promise, but He's given us Christ who is ever ready to help us to become what we ought to become. And the Word of God is filled with these promises and illustrations of how we ought not to be victims. We ought not to stick with victimhood. We ought not to be victims of sin or of self. We can be overcomers. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There had no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Does the Bible say, well, you don't need to take responsibility and accountability. You just keep on living life. Don't worry about it. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there's been no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation, also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. God has a way out. We don't need to stick with the bad habits, with the sinful desires. And He will always give us enough that is needed in order to be overcomers. But we need to realize this, not only today, but ongoingly. If Jesus hasn't returned yet, it tells us that we have not fully grasped this. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, the Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusted against the Spirit. There's this battle that we've been talking about. 
that Paul talked about earlier in the book of Romans, between the old man and the new man. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to another, so that ye cannot do things that ye would. The battle will be ongoing, but the solution is ever present and there. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, the Bible says, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove that it is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's a battle for our minds. Satan is trying to keep us trapped. And he uses many different ways in order to achieve that. He wants us to recognize ourselves as victims. Victims of somebody else. This is what he did with Adam. Because he just followed the same inclinations that were there with him in the beginning of time. But Revelation 12, 11 tells us, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. We can be overcomers. You and I can be overcomers. Not in a limited way, but in the complete way. We've already been given the examples. We looked at Satan and Adam. We looked at two examples that they gave us, which are contrary to what God wants to see in our lives. And He's given us the lessons to escape that. So now let's look at the opposite examples. Here comes Christ. And walks on this earth. And as he's about to come to the cross, as he gets on the cross, as he's in the very last minutes of his life, we see a completely different example than what we find with Satan in the beginning. Luke 23, 33 and 34, and then 46 says, And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the male factors, one on right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, hear the words that Jesus spoke, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. Not Father, put them in their place. The one who was truly a victim, a victim of this sinful world. Instead of searching to be recognized as a victim, he does what? He says, Father, forgive them. Forget about me. Forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. If we follow the example of Christ and continually surrender our spirits into the hands of Christ, we're going to be able to have the faith of Jesus and escape victimhood mentality. He's the most perfect example that we have seen of what it truly means to be an overcomer. But He's not alone. He's not alone. All throughout the Bibles, we don't just learn about the mistakes that the Jewish nation made and the sins that various individuals committed. These are not the only examples that we have been given. We've been given positive examples. We've been given examples of overcomers. And these overcomers are not limited. These overcoming examples, rather, are not limited 
to what Jesus Christ has achieved only. These examples extend beyond Him, and this is why when we open the Word of God, we are to receive strength as we look at the lives of these individuals and recognize how they have been able to keep the flesh in check. Here's one beautiful wording in Psalms 51, verses 1 through the 4 and 7, of David himself. Now, think about David here and the wording that he uses in Psalm 51 in comparison to Adam's words in the beginning that we read in Genesis chapter 3. Compare these two separate ways of how these individuals respond to sin being part of their life. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And here's the key. For I acknowledge my transgressions. It's not the circumstances that you put me in. It's not, well, it was because this lady, you see, she was there across my window and there was no way out to escape that. It just led me into sin. It's not my fault, Lord. It's this lady's fault who was out there bathing so I could see her. That's not what he's saying. He said, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Not only is David here in the position of acknowledgement, he's not running away of the discomfort that the conviction has brought to him, He's welcoming that. He's acknowledging that. And then he realizes, you know what? Just like Paul said in Romans chapter 7, there's no way out for me. I'm just going to keep on doing these things. This old man is just going to keep on coming back. I'm just used to doing the things that I have been doing, Lord. The only way I can be clean is if you purge me with hyssop. It's only if you wash me will I be able to be whiter than snow. Not only did he acknowledge his sin, but he also recognized the power of God and how much it is needed in the day-to-day -day battle against sin and the flesh. You see, the life of David is your life and my life. Just like David, the Spirit comes and tries to help us, to convict us. And just like David and Adam, there are two ways out from here. Are we going to stick with that which is this? Comforting the, that which we are used to, the bad habit that has been present in our life for years? Or are we going to acknowledge our shortcomings? The testimonies talk about overcoming and prescribe not just the solution, just as the Bible has, but she also demonstrates to us how this ongoing battle is not just a walk in the park, so to speak. Overcoming sin is not an easy task. Because fighting against self is not an easy task. 
She says in the Review and Herald of July 9, 1908, the expression, he that overcometh, indicates that there's something for every one of us to overcome. Every single one of us that is present here today, we all have something to overcome. Let us not run away from reality, from convictions. Let us not seek excuses. Well, you know what? My husband or my wife, well, they, they, just, they just get on my nerves so much. Whatever it might be. My boss at work. My neighbor down the street. My childhood. Oh, I've had such a terrible upbringing. I've had so much trauma in my life. There will never be an excuse. She says, every one of us has something to overcome. The overcomer is to be clothed in the white raiment of Christ's righteousness, and of him it is written, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Oh, what a privilege it is to be an overcomer and to have our names presented before the Father by the Savior Himself. And when as overcomers we shall be clothed in white raiment, the Lord will acknowledge our faithfulness as verily as in the days of the early Christian church He acknowledged the few names, even in Sardis, who had not defiled their garments. And we shall walk with Him in white for through His anointing, atoning sacrifice, we shall be accounted worthy. It means much to be an overcomer. It is not an easy task. And not only is it not an easy task, it is everything that we want beside our names. Specifically, as we are coming into the close of human probation. The besetments of the enemy and all his evil agencies must be firmly resisted. They're not going to go away. Every moment we must be on guard, not for one instant. Every moment we must be on guard, not for one instant are we to lose sight of Christ and of his power to save in the hour of trial. Our hand must be placed in his, that we may be upheld by the power of his might. More and more on the how. That is the solution. Hold fast to Christ and He will give you His strong arm to lean upon. There's a crown of life for the overcomer. To the overcomer is promised a crown of immortality, immortal glory, and a life that measures with the life of God. The overcomer will have a whole heaven of bliss with no tempting devil, no sorrow, sickness, pain, nor death. I desire to know more about heaven, and I am determined by God's grace to be there. Let us all strive to obtain an abundant entrance into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, where we shall be surrounded with beautiful objects surpassing by far anything that we could imagine. Jesus is here to tell us that this world is not worth anything in comparison to the world to come. Being stuck in this bondage, being back here in Egypt, is not worth. It's not worth it to keep on being here. Just as it wasn't for the Egyptian people when he excuse me, for the Jewish people when he wanted to take them out of Egypt. Forget about that which is familiar, he says. It is time for us to become overcomers so we can go home. Christ bids us bring all of heaven you can into your life. Talk of the great reward that awaits the overcomer. You know, we ask often, well, well, what do we do? 
Yes, we know that we are stuck here. We know that we are stuck with old tendencies and bad character traits. What do we do? What is the solution? Talk of the great reward that awaits the overcomer. Set your face as a flint heavenward saying as you advance, hear what the Lord has wrought for me. Shall we not come up to the help of the Lord against the mighty? Shall we not work with all the power that God has given us to oppose the work of Satan? God's given us power and the power of choice above everything else. It's not good enough to recognize our weaknesses. That is the first step. But just like Paul says it in Romans chapter 7, and just like David did in Psalms 51, we need to reach out to the solution. Just like Jesus kept himself in the hands of the Father all the time, we need to keep ourselves into the hands of Jesus all the time. Because after the conviction, his office works transfers into that of the Comforter. The moment we realize the conviction and acknowledge that, Jesus comes immediately and goes into the office of a comforter, a helper, someone to give us power and strength. Shall we not work with all the power that God has given us to oppose the work of Satan? An eternal weight of glory awaits us if we do so. If we gain heaven, we gain everything. Shall we not put away sin and let Christ abide in our hearts by faith? Not until we have the mind of Christ shall we be like Him and see Him as He is. When the warfare is ended and we have gained the crown of immortality, the harp of God, the palm branch of victory, and wear the white rope of Christ's righteousness, we shall say heaven is cheap enough. Heaven is cheap enough, brothers and sisters. Here's another key on the how. How do we do it? Never become discouraged. Oh, that thing came up again. I thought I had taken care of it. Well, it just seems that I'll never be able to fix this one thing. And I'll just keep on living life. No. Never become discourage. Never think that a bad trade that pops up is not going to be taken care of without the power of Christ. She says, never become discouraged. In order to fight successfully, a soldier must have both strength and courage. And in God, there's strength and courage sufficient for every worker. Hallelujah. Amen. There's enough for you and enough for me enough for everyone who is willing to walk this difficult road on this earth. Be determined that you will be an overcomer. Constantly behold Jesus. Meditate on His character that by beholding you may become changed into His image. Here are some practical lessons of how all these things take hold of our lives and bring in a positive change and transformation. And lastly, she says, make Christ your dependence. Thus, you may every day be increasingly enriched by His love. But without Him, you're helpless, utterly unable to subdue one sin or to overcome the smallest temptation. May God help you to understand the words, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Connection with Christ is a positive necessity. If the fruit we bear is to be acceptable to God, connection with Him results in purity of heart, in a what kind of life? In a faultless life. That is His goal. That is what He wants to see in me and in you. We are to be able 
to look back and recognize this progression. Remember, when Jacob fell asleep, he saw this ladder that was going from the earth to heaven. And, and, and what is this idea of a ladder being there? Well, we have to be climbing every single day. This is why sanctification is the work of a lifetime. Because the fact that we might have been with Christ yesterday does not necessarily mean that we are with Him today, this afternoon even. The work of the overcomer is a close and trying work. It is a difficult work. It is contrary to that which we are comfortable with. What were the Jewish people complaining when God sent Moses to take them out of Egypt? Well, they were not willing to put up with the difficulties of the journey. Well, what about you and me? Are we ready to put up with the difficulties of the journey? The work of an overcomer is close and trying work. We have individually to fight the good fight of faith and war against the powers of darkness. For when the truth commences, the work of purifying the soul temple, the conflict between good and evil begins in earnest. Brothers and sisters, we have seen these two examples presented to us. The Bible is just such a powerful lesson book. It, God gives us examples and solutions. He ties everything together. But at the end of the day, you and I have to make the decision. There's this thing called a free will. God cannot work against our decision. Just as the Jewish people had the free will choice to allow God to take them out immediately and to bring them to the promised land, so do we have the exact same choice given to us. But unfortunately, looking back and, and seeing how long we have been here, it seems to me that we have been even far more rebellious than the Jewish people. They only wandered for, for 40 years. The Advent people have been wandering for almost four times that period. God was ready at the end of the 1800s to take them home. But it seems to me that we are still comfortable here. We are still finding excuses like Satan did and Adam did. We are still playing victimhood. But God is calling us for something else. He wants to see us fight the good fight of faith, this trying work, and make the decision to walk with Him day in and day out. May we examine our lives and our characters, first and foremost, and see, could there be something there that I am excusing or not realizing is being present. And when we do that and when we accomplish that and when we allow Him to finish the work that He would like to finish in us, it's a twofold work, then we'll be able to see Him face to face one day soon. So in closing, I just, just want to ask everyone here for your answer. Victim or overcomer? Which one is it going to be in your life? Are you going to stop excusing yourself? Am I going to stop excusing myself so we can truly allow the Lord to finish the work that He has promised to finish in us? His promises are true. They will never come short. It is just a matter of you and me believing and accepting that and coming to Him day in and day out. 
So how many overcomers do we have here today? How many of us want to be overcomers and not victims? That is the first step. But the first step is just as important in every other step. The Lord has seen our hands, so let us now kneel and petition Him in prayer to help us do that which we want to accomplish. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you because we ought to know that there's a solution to the sin problem, a complete solution, not a partial solution, but a complete solution. Father, I pray and ask that we can recognize how tempting it is to excuse ourselves. The Bible tells us even that there are times when our own minds are going to play tricks on us and are going to convince us that we're doing the right thing while we are breaking your law. Father, I pray and ask that you teach every single one of us to take accountability and responsibility, not to shun your voice of conviction, but to embrace it. I want us to be like David, Father, to acknowledge our sins and our shortcomings and to desire to become whiter than snow. It begins with our choice, continual choice for that matter. It is not a choice that we just need to make today at this moment. It is a continual choice. As the testimony said, we ought to keep our eyes on Jesus. And the moment we take our eyes off of Jesus, that's when we get into trouble. There's indeed power in the blood, enough power for every single one of us to replicate the life of Christ. He wants to live His life in us. And we're living at the end of time, and the Word of God tells us that this mystery that you have spoken of, Christ in us, the hope of glory, will be finished. Do we believe it and do we want it part of our lives? Help us, Lord. Help us to recognize what is needed in me. Help us to recognize what is needed in us as individuals so that we could truly lighten up this world with your glory. This world is not going to go away until it's been lightened up with your glory. Help us to play part in that. We leave everything into thy hands and we pray and ask this in the precious name of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.